Hey guys, Crypto Dad here again. Thanks for joining me. Here's a reminder. Take the sausage out of the freezer. Uh, Alexa is reminding me. Uh, welcome to the live stream Friday night. Uh, thank you for joining me. Got a lot of stuff I want to talk about. Uh, I'm glad you're all here. Uh, let's go uh, jump right in. Okay, guys, thanks for joining me tonight. Uh, I've got my phone here, and I didn't get a chance to uh, turn off auto lock uh, because when I share my phone with you guys, uh, auto lock kind of messes with things. So uh, I wanted to talk about some uh, big things that are going on in crypto. Uh, the UN uh, Child Charity Agency now is accepting Bitcoin and Ethereum, which I find uh, great adoption news. Uh, there's news from BAKT, B-A-K-K-T. Uh, they had a big upsurge in their uh, daily volume on their futures. Uh, so that's big news. And then uh, I've got some more stuff to talk about uh, related to tech, two-factor authentication, and, you know, all that nerdy stuff about cryptography that uh, underlies the way that uh, Bitcoin works. And, of course, you know, most of the other altcoins are also based on the Bitcoin blockchain. So uh, a lot of those things apply to a lot of the other altcoins as well. So uh, looks like I'm done with the phone here. Let's see if it's going to share on my screen. And yes, that's good stuff. Uh, I've got my rig behind me tonight. And uh, this is uh, one of the uh, set, uh, I'm not sure what you call it. it it's a overall lighting scheme and I think they call them if I can see here oh of course I can't I can't think of the word while I'm talking to you guys um, oh lighting link is what they call this so when I set a, a scheme on uh, say the light strips and the fans uh, it uh, sort of goes to all of them so uh, they're all coordinated, and uh, they're all Corsair. So uh, pretty cool stuff. If you're interested in uh, rig lighting, uh, I have some videos on that. So I invite you to check them out. Just kind of Google Corsair lighting uh, and Crypto Dad, and you'll find uh, some videos on how you set all this up. So uh, I like to sort of showcase uh, what I'm interested in with you guys, you, most of your loyal viewers. So uh, let's switch over to the uh, screen here. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and turn this one off. That's gonna be for our uh, close-ups of our ledger as we work tonight. Uh, so first let's talk about Bitcoin. Uh, we still haven't seen uh, the march towards the all-time high, uh, really. We sort of saw it in the middle of the year uh, there's my phone. I can share with you guys later. Uh, let's close this off here and let's go to uh, our price charts. So uh, as Bitcoin rolled along this year, it's still the uh, best performing asset uh, year to date. Uh, it's outperformed the stock market, uh, S&P 500, NASDAQ. It's outperformed gold. Uh, if you bought Bitcoin at the beginning of the year in January, uh, you would have uh, seen your uh, capital grow by 200%, um, pretty sure. But uh, we're not at our uh, highs for the year either. Uh, Bitcoin made a run at maybe 1500 earlier in mid-year, uh, got up to about, uh, it flirted with 13, I think, or maybe it flirted with 12, uh, came back. Uh, sort of consolidated around 10 for a while, went down, went up. Uh, and uh, a couple weeks ago, I believe, it uh, went down from 10 down to 7,800 and has been uh, kind of flirting around with uh, the 81, 8,200 mark for the last week or so. Um, and then uh, sort of took back off again uh, the day before yesterday. And then uh, I believe late last night or early today, it shot up. And let's take a look at the chart here. Let's look at the day chart. 
I'm not sure if that was today. I guess it was right about here. Uh, shot up to about 87.14 and uh, then traced back down again. So we started off the day, uh, I, I guess uh, the day before yesterday, it was up around 86, which was quite promising. And then it took this big uptick earlier in the day up to about 87. And now it has uh, found its way back down uh, to the 83, 85. Uh, we're down a little bit uh, right now, uh, 83.23. But uh, long-term, Bitcoin is looking good. Year-to-date, Bitcoin is looking good. Um, we still have room uh, to, uh, for the, we've still got uh, quite a bit of the year left, a few more months, so we might see another run-up. Um, and we're also seeing a lot of divergence in uh, the Bitcoin price action from the altcoin price action. So a lot of the altcoins are uh, kind of on their own track now. Uh, of course, as a general rule, the altcoins tend to follow Bitcoin up and down. But we have been seeing quite a bit of divergence in the last few months where, uh, say, Bitcoin is uh, consolidating and hanging out in a certain range. And you'll see uh, big upticks and downticks in the altcoins. So uh, that's good. That's healthy that the altcoins have their own uh, patterns as opposed to just riding along on the coattails of Bitcoin. So all in all, things are going good. And we have been getting a lot of good adoption news. The big story that I wanted to point out tonight was uh, the story about the UN Charity Agency. Oh. Okay, I guess I didn't put them in here. Uh. Uh, okay. All right. I can deal with it. Okay. UN agency. <laughs> I thought I had marked all these. Oh, I put them down in the uh, descriptions. <laughs> Let's, I can just do it that way. I can do it the same way you guys are doing it. All right. So uh, let's see. Whoops. We don't want to do that. Uh, we don't want to see myself. Um... Uh, here we go. All right, so I am just going to use my own link that I put down in here. Because I put these down here for you guys, I'm starting to do that every week. Uh, come on, Rex. <laughs> All right. Lord, get it together. This is the one I want to talk about first. Pardon me, guys. We'll get there. Right, we will get there. All right. First, let me say hello to everybody that's here. If anyone is here, let's see where we are here. <laughs> okay, someone is here. That's good news. All right. <laughs> All right. So, uh, Darland, Dal Daland, Martin, hello, Marvin, hello, EKS, EKS, uh, Calgapo, Mr. David. Dan Westra, Crypto Time. I'm great. I'm glad you guys are all here. CFI Randy. Uh, I am enjoying fall in Michigan. Thank you for asking. Uh, let's see. David says there seems to be a lot of FUD out there today. Uh, Chuck is here. Nice to see you. Crypto Time. Grand Illusion from Idaho. Uh, Kavishian. Uh, Juan Zayas. David Nelson. And uh, that's it for now. So uh, hello, everybody, and thanks for joining us. Uh, so uh, can we get that story? Did I put it in my... What did I do with that story? <laughs> Boy. Okay, here we go. Uh, UN Children's Charity Fund announces a pilot program to accept Bitcoin and Ethereum. Uh, they partnered with the Ethereum... Uh, there's an uh, agency here. Um, I read about it. The Ethereum uh, Foundation. Uh, and the Ethereum Foundation uh, made uh, one of the first donations. Uh, they donated one Bitcoin and 10,000 Ethereum. And so now this agency, UNICEF, is uh, set up to accept donations in Bitcoin and Ethereum. So uh, that's a worldwide agency that will be able to accept donations 
anywhere from anywhere in the world from individuals without uh, any banks uh, or charity agencies uh, that are going to be in between, right? They're going to be able to accept direct donations. Not only will this make it easier for people to donate and easier for UNICEF to accept donations, it's also going to make that the entire process more transparent because Bitcoin and Ethereum are public blockchains, so all of the donations will be trackable and uh, they won't be able to hide any money or play around with it. Uh, so that's a really big development in uh, the overall uh, adoption of blockchain and cryptocurrencies. So I'm really happy about that. Um, also, uh, I didn't uh, put this story down in the links, but the SEC uh, did once again um, reject the Bitcoin uh, ETF again. And it's almost like people have... Uh, price that into the market now so it's not a big of deal as it was earlier I'm gonna turn off that lighting it's reflecting on me um, but uh, in fact the markets tended to kind of shrug it off so it's almost as if we've just accepted that the SEC uh, is going to take a long time uh, to uh, accept a Bitcoin exchange traded fund and uh, I saw some other videos about this and I thought about this myself when I saw their reasoning, uh, their excuse or whatever you want to call it as to why they had denied it. And they talked about uh, market manipulation and fraud and all that stuff. And we all know very well that uh, there are lots of gold exchange traded funds out there and they are uh, being manipulated left and right while the regulatory agencies uh, look the other way or uh, don't have enough manpower to prosecute. But we just recently heard a story about uh, traders uh, on uh, Chase, I believe, that were manipulating the price of gold on the markets by placing false orders and then uh, uh, canceling them right before they executed it in order to sort of uh, bring everyone else uh, think that they were about to trade uh, big orders. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of uh, manipulation out there. Uh, not saying that, you know, because everyone else is doing it, it's okay for Bitcoin uh, markets to do it. I'm just saying that it's a pretty lame excuse when you bring up uh, fraud and manipulation of the markets as your excuse for not accepting a Bitcoin uh, ETF. Similar to the way that they uh, are constantly bashing Bitcoin uh, as, as being responsible for uh, money laundering. Um, most of the uh, money laundering that occurs in this world is done in cash. Uh, and a very small amount of Bitcoin transactions are what you would call illicit or uh, you know, market washing type uh, money laundering type of activity. So uh, just the, the big guys don't accept Bitcoin and they probably never will. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, another good story that's out there, if I can uh, get back into this thing again, is uh, the backed story. The backed uh, Bitcoin futures uh, soared almost 800%. Whoops. Eek. Oh, I'm just having a lot of trouble today. I don't know what it is. Okay. I meticulously copied all of these earlier in the day and then forgot to throw them into my links. So I'm having to cut and paste from my descriptions. Uh, so the backed Bitcoin futures volume soared almost 800% in one day. An incredible and slightly confounding turn of events backed Bitcoin futures volume has soared as much as 796%, uh, far cry from their previous volumes, and a bullish sign of revival for back following its lackluster beginnings. So, and this uh, is kind of under the radar, right? Uh, everyone else was sort of uh, hoop lying uh, when back opened, and then there was a lot of disappointment that, you know, the, the, they didn't have the stellar volumes uh, their first few days. 
but now that uh, the volume is spiking, uh, you're not hearing a lot about it. Um, you're hearing it from me, which is why you tune into this stuff. All right. So that's a good sign. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and if you listen to Crypto Lark, he'll talk about, you know, a lot of this, uh, you know, this anticipation of adoption by big institutions with ETFs and futures contracts and all those sort of things are good exposure for Bitcoin, good liquidity for Bitcoin and the other cryptocurrencies. But uh, really, it's a way for the, the big players to sort of make money and squeeze the market and do what they do with the stock market and the gold market and all the other things that, uh, you know, they, they like to play around in. So uh, good and bad, sweet and sour, I guess, if you will. All right. Um, whoops. Oh. <laughs> whoops, I went blurry. All right. Ugh, and I'm still blurry. Okay. <laughs> oh. What's going on down there? <clears throat> I don't know. Okay. All right, I'm back. <laughs> Something is beeping and I do not know what it is. Okay. I do not know. All right, can you guys still hear me? I hope. All right. All right. <laughs> Crazy day. All right. All right. So uh, let's see. I don't know that there was any other big news stories that I wanted to cover. Uh, yeah. And, th and this is more about encryption in general. And uh, you guys know that uh, in cryptography is uh, one of the underlying technologies uh, for Bitcoin and blockchain based cryptocurrencies. And I don't know why this particular story seems to take a while to load, but it does. Uh, so I'll just uh, stall while I wait for it. I don't know if it's a low. Yeah, it does sound like a low battery. Uh, it sounds like my. Oh, hmm. I think it's my secondary computer. Um, I've got another computer under here that I use for playing around. See, I can't even reach it. All right, let's see if it'll come on, baby. Anyway, this is a story about uh, William Barr, uh, who has been uh, threatening uh, Facebook and telling him that, you know, it's oh so wrong to uh, incorporate uh, encrypted communications into all of their uh, messaging platforms. So uh, if you're not aware, uh, I believe WhatsApp is encrypted. So uh, when you uh, communicate with someone using WhatsApp, you're in, you, it is encrypted end to end. And Facebook is planning on rolling that out for all of their uh, messaging apps, Instagram and Facebook Messenger. My God, why won't this pull up? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's censored. Okay, let's try it from over here. See what happens. Because I have pulled it up earlier. You want some coffee? Please, thank you. All right, here it is. Here it goes. Okay. So, uh, Attorney General Barr is uh, telling Facebook that uh, do not uh, encrypt all of your services. Uh, because the government needs to be able to, you know, see what everybody's talking about to catch the uh, pedophiles and the drug cartels and the money launderers and everything else. Uh, and so the, you know, of the, you know, what, 5% of the population are these nefarious criminals or less. But uh, because of that small, tiny minority of criminals, uh, the rest of the, you know, uh, public who haven't done anything wrong need to also be monitored because you know there's no way to you know uh, yeah <laughs> so anyway it's kind of a ridiculous premise you know they basically just want to monitor everyone's communications 
and they use that special case of the uh, the child molester to shock everybody into saying, oh, of course, you know, we don't care if you, we're not doing anything wrong, so of course you can look at all my emails and all my transcripts of all my conversations and uh, whatnot. So, and that's the way they shock us. It's kind of the same argument where, you know, you say that uh, you would forgive anyone for everything because you're a loving person. And then they, there's always that one spoiler that wants to say, oh, what if Hitler killed your mom? You know, would you forgive him? You know, they always want to throw out that one exception to the rule to try to taint, you know, the entire uh, belief, you know. And the belief is, is that people that, uh, that want to communicate with their friends and their neighbors and their business people should uh, have reasonable expectation of privacy. And the government doesn't like that at all, apparently. Uh, so they want, um, uh, they want back doors built into these encryption. Now, uh, I've got off on a tangent here, but the, uh, the issue is that encryption was built to be uh, secure. It's mathematically secure. And to try to build a backdoor into an encryption algorithm uh, is uh, just not philosophically compliant with the way that uh, the uh, encryption works, right? Uh, the idea of encryption is that only the person with the key at the other end is privy to the communications. So if you're going to somehow build some sort of rig, some backdoor into this encryption code, it's going to be uh, unsafe. It's, it's, going, it's not going to be robust code. It's going to be buggy code that has a backdoor in it. And, uh, you know, several issues arise. First of all, if we've got this uh, back door, who's to say that uh, some hacker won't also discover the back door and be able to see uh, our communications? And then we also have the issue of people that are within the government or subcontracted by the government that are abusing the privilege of having this back door to spy on their ex-girlfriend or uh, you know whatever the case may be. There's the, and this is not. Uh, you know, this is not out of the ordinary. This uh, Edward Snowden revealed that this was uh, practically rampant at Booz Hamilton, uh, an NSA subcontractor where he worked, that a lot of the employees were abusing the privilege of their access to these communications for their own selfish ends. So, and then uh, we also have that other case of even if everything is going according to plan, perhaps the plan of the government is to create a surveillance state where uh, they can watch anyone and uh, aim their, not only at pedophiles and money launderers, but uh, people that are legitimately protesting government policies. So uh, there's a whole host of horrible things that uh, could happen if we don't allow encryption to be what it is. So uh, I invite you to take a look at this article. It uh, sort of cuts to the heart of the matter uh, of what Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies are based on. It's a very interesting read. Uh, so I would encourage you to take a look at that. Right. And, uh, and then while we're on the subject of encryption, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, let me see if I can find the article here. Whoops. Go over got more than one. Oh, it finally pulled up over there. Oh, this is okay. <laughs> Go figure. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about encryption later on. Uh, but I guess what I want to throw out there is that Bitcoin uh, cryptography is used in Bitcoin and blockchain, but it is not used to encrypt transactions. Transactions are transparent on the blockchain. And uh, the cryptography is used for the digital signature. The digital signature is what verifies a transaction and mathematically proves that you are the owner of the Bitcoin stored at that address. So that's what our private key does. It basically signs transactions. So once that signature is attached to the transaction, uh, the, the private key is no longer uh, available, you know, the, the private key is held by the owner of the address. 
So a signed transaction is viewable, right? We can view it and it's cryptographically, it can be cryptographically tested to, to determine that it was signed by the person in possession of the private key, but the transactions are not encrypted. And that's the difference between normal encryption. We all use encryption every day. Whenever we use our credit card on Amazon or uh, any other uh, Best Buy or Home Depot, whenever we buy anything online or we uh, log into our bank account, uh, we are using end-to-end -end encryption. All of our transactions back and forth to our bank are encrypted so that uh, someone that is uh, intercepts those transactions cannot read them. So uh, we should we all understand that uh, bank transactions should be encrypted and uh, you know purchases and credit card information should be encrypted. Uh, it's really a big fact of life. But I just found it interesting that Bitcoin transactions are not encrypted. They're just digitally signed using the science of cryptography. All right, so uh, let's move over to this interesting story. And uh, I would like to know if uh, any of you guys, uh, <laughs> you'd like to take this test. Maybe we'll take it together. Let's take a look at the article. I'm just gonna stay in Chrome, I don't know why. Uh, Americans and digital knowledge. A majority of U.S. adults can answer fewer than half the questions correctly on a digital knowledge quiz, and many struggle with certain cybersecurity and privacy questions. Uh, so this uh, Pew Research Center gave this a uh, quiz, and uh, a very uh, surprisingly small percentage of adults uh, are able to actually answer all of the questions correctly. And one of the questions involves two-factor authentication, which I talk about quite a bit here on the live stream, and I talk about quite a bit uh, on, on some of my videos. Uh, Google Authenticator uh, is the two-factor authenticator that I use. Um, but if you're not using any, uh, SMS uh, authentication is the next best thing, but it has its weaknesses. But uh, interestingly enough, uh, there are a very small percentage of people that are actually using two-factor authentication. Uh, only 20% of adults answered seven or more questions correctly, and just 2% got all 10 questions correct. So uh, all of my uh, faithful followers here, why don't we take a look at this quiz and see how we fare. I believe this is it. All right, so let's, boom. All right, if a website uses cookies, it means that the site uh, uh, can see the content of all files on the device you're using, is not a risk to infect your device with a computer virus, will automatically prompt you to update your web browser software as out of date, or can track your visits and activity on the site, or not sure. So, uh, Anyone want to take a stab at that one? <laughs> I think there's like a little bit of a lag uh, between when I talk and when you guys answer, so I won't hold up the stream too much. Hey, Blockchain Digital Asset News just gave me a tip. It's my favorite fan. Last name ends with the fifth month of the year. January, February, March, April, May. May. It's William May. <laughs> and he's got his uh, he's got a new identity. That's pretty cool. Let's uh, let's follow this link here. If I can it will it take me if I do that? Go to channel. Okay. Let's see what happens. Ah cool. Blockchain digital asset news. Crypto news you can use. Well, I'm glad to see that you're uh, expanding your uh, blockchain and digital asset uh, horizons. I mean, I know your real estate, that's your day job. I've got a day job too, where I dispatch drivers uh, and then do some back office work from home. But, uh, you know, I really enjoy uh, doing the channel and studying about uh, cryptography and blockchain. Those are my interests, so I'm glad William is expanding uh, 
his horizons. I, I thoroughly encourage everybody out there to uh, expand their horizons. I guess that's the, the overarching uh, concept that I will put out there for you guys. Uh, you know, uh, we work uh, day to day. We get up, you know, we get ready. We go to work. We come home. Uh, we watch TV. Uh, you know, we may have hobbies. And if any of you have hobbies, uh, you know, I encourage that as well. But uh, a, wh a while back, uh, I decided that I would wake up early at three o'clock in the morning. I, I spoke to a guy. I was doing computer consulting and I had this great guy who's a customer of mine in his 90s and he gave me this whole story about he was working at an insurance company and uh, he wanted to uh, make more money but he needed uh, to pass some kind of real estate licensing test and so he uh, had a family and he couldn't study uh, during the, the night, the evening or the day, he was working in the day and he couldn't study in the evening because his family was around. So he woke up at 3 a.m. every morning and studied for this, uh, real estate, uh, license thing or whatever it was, insurance, I think it was, and, uh, ended up, uh, passing it, getting the, the license and being able to move up in his job and, uh, you know, vastly improved his income and his life. Uh, and that was an inspiration to me. And what I decided to do at three o'clock in the morning was take some online courses um, on a free college website. And uh, I took a class on cryptography. I took uh, several classes, cryptography being the one that sort of stuck with me the most. Now I tell you, I, wasn't a, I wouldn't have passed that class, really. I didn't uh, follow it close enough to pass all of his tests uh, because cryptography involves a lot of math uh and it's pretty heavy math you know we're talking uh like linear algebra and stuff uh, but it did inspire me uh to move on and learn more about uh, a subject matter so i i highly encourage anyone out there uh, and i congratulate william uh to uh, find something uh that's off topic of your life and study it and learn about it and even if it's for nothing, right, it might turn into something down the road, like pure research, right? There's a lot of applied research that goes on in the scientific community. And then there's a lot of pure research that goes on where, uh, you know, there's physicists and chemists just doing experiments uh, for pure research purposes. And they make discoveries doing those that lead to more applied research. So do some pure research in your life, learn a new topic, take up knitting, whatever it is, uh, and uh, I guarantee you, uh, you'll be happier, your life will change. You don't have to wake up at three o'clock in the morning. Uh, you can you know, set your own schedule, but uh, I encourage you guys to go, go for that. Okay, so here we go. Uh, let's move on to our next question. Uh, we know, oh, <laughs> sorry. We know that that uh, cookies track our activity. <clears throat> Which of the following is the largest source of revenue for most major social media platforms? Um, license deals, advertising, hosting, consulting, not sure. Well, um, if you've watched this live stream and watched some of my videos, uh, we've talked about this. Uh, these companies uh, live on advertising. And they basically take your personal information and uh, sell it to the highest bidder. And these are advertising companies. Thanks again, William. Uh, yeah, a lot of successful people knowingly or unknowingly use the miracle morning technique. That's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when a website has a privacy policy, it means that. Now, a lot of people see privacy policies that pop up and they're these huge documents that they basically just click OK. What is a privacy policy? Does that just mean that they're going to keep my data private? No. It just means they have a policy that spells out what they do keep private and what they don't. Uh, here it is. Has created a contract between itself and its users on how it will use their data. Uh, it's definitely not will not share their data. Uh, all right, so let's cruise on. 
what does it mean when a website has HTTPS uh, at the beginning? And here we are back to our uh, encryption. Yeah. <laughs> Two ads and sell my data, right? <laughs> Uh, information entered on the site is encrypted. The content of the site is safe for children. The site is only accessible to people in certain countries. The site has been verified as trustworthy. Now, a lot of people might think this one because when you're on an HTTP site, most bra uh, when you're on an, yeah, just a regular HTTP site, you'll get that thing up top that says not secure. Uh, so uh, the HTTP, but it's really that it's just telling you that the information is encrypted. Right. Ah, now this is the one that I got wrong earlier today because I overthought it. Uh, but what, where might someone encounter a phishing scam? We hear a lot about phishing scams. Um, we don't know exactly what they are. Uh, my faux pas was uh, confusing a generalized phishing scam with a targeted phishing scam. And uh, there's a difference, you know, uh, a targeted phishing scam is usually directed uh, after a social media. There's different phases of the hack, right? They start with uh, social engineering, pardon me, not social media. Social engineering is gathering information and talking to people and uh, misrepresenting yourself to gather information about them. Uh, social engineering is like calling a phone company and pretending to be the owner of a phone and getting them to forward the number over. Uh, that's a social engineering. It just basically means manipulating people. So through social engineering, they find out who the important people in the company are um, and who uh, the higher ups are. And then they tailor their emails to appear to come from someone else in the company. Uh, and that's a phishing scam. It's an email link that someone is tricked into clicking. But uh, phishing scams can come in other forms too. So you've probably guessed that they're more than just emails. Uh, they can be all of the above. They can be on social media. They can be in it. You can get, I've, I should have known this because I saw, I've seen text uh, phishing scams before too. They say, you know, click here, you know, whatever. So it's actually all of the above, right? And then we can go to the next one. Uh, which two companies listed below are both owned by Facebook? Uh, I sort of knew this one. So, uh, you know, Twitter and Instagram, Snapchat and WhatsApp, WhatsApp and Instagram, Twitter and Snapchat. Well, we can uh, take Twitter out right away because we know Facebook doesn't own Twitter. So that just takes us down to these two. Um, Snapchat is not owned by Facebook, I don't think. <laughs> WhatsApp. Yeah, I don't think Snapchat is owned by Facebook. It must be WhatsApp and Instagram. We'll see. I got it right this morning. Okay, net neutrality, which is uh, kind of a hot button political issue that hasn't been in the news much. Uh, but uh, net neutrality has to do with anyone that creates their own website should have equal access to uh, the internet community, right? So just because you happen to be Netflix uh, doesn't mean that you should get all the bandwidth uh, and then the smaller guy that's running a blog has really low bandwidth because he's not paying extra to uh, Time Warner or Spectrum or Comcast or whoever, right? So net neutrality refers to Internet service providers should treat all traffic on their networks equally, right? They shouldn't give sweetheart deals to big companies that want to pay extra for higher bandwidth. All right, and we'll go next here. Uh, private browsing. Now, this one uh, kind of fools a lot of people. A lot of people think private browsing means no one can see the websites that you're on. Um, really, it only means that... Uh, Anyone else that uses your computer won't be able to see the websites that you're on. Your, whatever you look at in uh, private mode is not hidden from your ISP or uh, the, the websites that you're visiting and that sort of thing. So uh, private mode only works, and this is uh, someone at an office, private mode only hides 
from a coworker who happens to use the same computer or another person in your household. It's just the way it works. Okay, and here's the one that most people failed. Uh, we do this, you see me do it all the time. So uh, we're two-factor authentication. So uh, it's basically just entering a, a code, a secondary code on a login screen. And most of the time you, you log in and then the next screen is the two-factor code. This is a case of the two-factor code being on the same page. But it's not a CAPTCHA and it's not the security image and uh, it's not the security questions, although that is a little bit ambiguous because two-factor authentication uh, sometimes asks security questions too. It is another way of authenticating the user, but uh, in this case, it's the code that we enter, right? And I guess a lot of people were getting this one wrong. And then uh, this one, uh, who is this guy, who's who is the technology leader? Uh, that's just kind of whether you follow the news or not. Uh, this is Jack Dorsey of Twitter. All right. Well, we got 10 of 10 because I took this earlier and I knew uh, what the answers were. But as I said, I got that fishing one wrong earlier. Uh, so I was thinking of moving some crypto around. And once again, thanks, uh, William, for the tip. I always appreciate it when you come by. Uh, I'm glad to see you guys here. Uh, I think there's another article that I had here. Oh, yeah. And there's a link to that quiz there if you want to take it now that you know all the answers. Uh, I've been reading a, a great book, uh, which I, I put down. <laughs> I don't have it right in front of me here. It's called Mastering uh, Bitcoin. And uh, it's a uh, it's an excellent book. Um, you may you could buy it and never read all of it if you don't you know have a mind to. But uh, just the first couple of chapters are a great layman a layman's introduction to what how big what Bitcoin is and how it works. Um, and I've been reading it and sort of following through some of the code examples, and it's opened my eyes to a few things that. I uh, had wrong, and uh, I admit that I did not realize this, and uh, I wanted to sort of uh, touch on this topic again. We talked last week about, uh, or the week before, about uh, quantum computing and how there is a possibility that quantum computing, uh, you know, the, uh, the story was is that Bitcoin was in danger because Google had uh, somehow achieved a quantum computer. Uh, and uh, the, the implication there, one of the implications of that was that they could take the public key and derive the private key from that, uh, which uh, in its current state, if I can find this book here, oops, uh, which in its current state is impossible. Um, let's go down here. This uh, is an earlier, here we go. Whoops. This is an earlier version of the book. It's not the, the latest edition, so I'm not really revealing too much uh, by showing you guys this. But what I wanted to point out here is this little chart here. Uh, I hope that uh, you're able to see it well enough here. This is uh, the foundation of how a blockchain address works. And it starts with a private key. So we've talked a lot about private keys and how they're stored safely on the ledger uh, or encrypted on your phone or uh, you know written down on a piece of paper, uh, in a paper wallet, whatever. But the private key is the foundation of a, a Bitcoin address. And it starts with a 256-bit number, a really, really long number. Uh, not only is the number long, but the number you know, of choices within that pool is astronomically large. Uh, we can talk about that some other time. But the, the private key is run through a mathematical transformation called an elliptic curve 
multiplication. And from that, we derive the public key of the Bitcoin address. Now, the way that this mathematical transformation works is uh, one of the foundations of cryptography. It's a one-way transaction. You can derive the public key using the private key, but you can't go back the other way because that would require a brute force calculation that would take on the order of thousands of years. Uh, so that's the foundation. Now, but m the mistake that I wanted to point out that I've been making for quite some time, even on this live stream, the, pu the public key is not the Bitcoin address. I had those two confused. The public key is never really shown when you send someone your Bitcoin address. The Bitcoin address is derived from the public key using a hashing function. So when you show someone your Bitcoin address, you're not revealing your public key at all. You're revealing a hash of your public key. And that hashing function is also one way. So we cannot derive the public key knowing the Bitcoin address. So how do we expose our, Bitcoin, our public key? We expose our public key when we send a transaction out. Because as I mentioned earlier, the way that Bitcoin works to verify transactions, it uses the private key to sign a transaction. And then that transaction information, along with that uh, signature file, is also sent along with the public key because you can take the public key and verify the digital signature created using the private key. I know that's a little complicated, but that is the foundation of the trust that you can have in a Bitcoin transaction. If someone sends you a valid Bitcoin transaction, they've used their private key to sign it. You could take that public key that's been embedded in that outgoing transaction and mathematically verify it so that you can confirm that yes indeed that is the owner of that uh, bitcoin address and thus that bitcoin is valid all right our wallets generally do that for us we don't have to do it you know with a pen and paper right uh, our wallets validate those transactions uh, but i just wanted to point out that the bitcoin address that we talk about a lot you see me cutting and pasting bitcoin addresses a lot uh, that is not the public key. The public key is hidden from view. And if you have a Bitcoin wallet that you have never sent any funds out of, then you have not revealed your public key. Your public key is still hidden, right? You've generated some Bitcoin addresses, but you've not revealed your public key. So is uh, everybody sleeping yet? <laughs> oh, and uh, let me also point out that uh, if you are interested, you know, I, I talked about this, this one-way transaction from private key to public key, elliptic curve multiplication. If you're really uh, in the mood to broaden your horizons, then uh, you should check out this article on uh, elliptic, cryptography, elliptic curve cryptography explained. Um, I started to read this article. It's... Uh, a massive article, right? Very well written article, very current article, uh, just uh, posted October 7th. It goes into exactly, this is the crux of uh, the elliptic. This is an elliptic curve. And the way that the private key is used to create the public key is uh, basically a mathematical function using an elliptic curve, right? And so uh, you can go through this whole article uh, and find out uh, what uh, elliptic curve cryptography is all about and how it's a one-way transaction and uh, goes into a lot of details uh, about math, which uh, can be quite vexing. <laughs> so it's, it's a very long article, but a very, like I said, a very well-written article uh, that goes to the heart of the matter of uh, how special uh, cryptocurrencies are. Uh, cryptocurrencies use cryptography to verify the transactions. Normally, when you spend money, uh, you see that it's printed by the government and the government has a lot of 
uh, techniques that they use to prevent counterfeiting, right? And when someone sends you uh, money from their bank or writes a check, you know, the banks all uh, verify this. So I'm not trusting, Bob is not trusting Alice, Bob is trusting Alice's bank, right? Because Alice has a check written on her bank and, you know, it's a local bank and Bob will accept that check as payment. Or if Alice, uh, you know, goes to the store and Bob has, you know, a fruit market and she swipes her credit card, Bob doesn't have to trust Alice. He trusts uh, the credit card company. Uh, so uh, our normal uh, value transactions require third parties, right? So the idea of Bitcoin is uh, we're not having to trust third parties at all. We're trusting the math, right? So this allows us to trust each other. This allows Bob and Alice to transfer value without needing a third party in the middle, right? So this is the beauty of what Bitcoin is all about. And there's a lot of math behind it, and it's not anywhere close to being broken by uh, quantum computing. Uh, I could be wrong about that. Uh, all right. Uh, yeah, it's a long article. So I left a link to the article down in there. It talks a lot about encryption, public key encryption, private key. Yeah. Now, in this article, they're talking about sending encrypted messages back and forth. Whereas, uh, you know, Bitcoin is, uh, we're sending signed messages that can be cryptographically verified, right? Now, there are other uh, cryptocurrencies that do encrypt, like Dash and Monero and uh, Zcash, uh, Bitcoin is transparent. Uh, these other cryptocurrencies are privacy oriented and, and they do encrypt uh, their uh, transactions so that people can't see what's going on. All right, so pretty cool stuff. Like I said, long article. Uh, the guy uh, took a lot of time and effort to write the article. And if you're interested in this subject matter, I would highly recommend. All right. So uh, let's see, what can I send today? Is there any requests for anything that I could send? Uh, I wanted to check. Um, I've got, uh, let's see, what do I, oh, I, what I was going to do earlier, and I've been on this site all day. Yeah, it's funny how you don't get logged out of it. Um, poof, 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 poof. Uh, I bought some Ravencoin earlier and I did a video and I was going, I was going to show how you would transfer that Ravencoin uh, to another address, but unfortunately uh, Binance has, not, uh, has uh, not enabled withdrawals of Ravencoin yet. So I can't really show you how to do uh, the Ravencoin yet. So I'm kind of stuck here. I wasn't sure... I usually have a plan for some things that I want to move around uh, in cryptocurrency. Um, let's see. Oh, I guess I can uh, do a little bit of demo in crypto.com. Uh, actually, we can buy some Ravencoin on crypto.com, but I also noticed that uh, crypto.com uh, doesn't have uh, transfers for uh, Ravencoin yet either. So as you can see, it's available on crypto.com, but uh, the transfers aren't active yet. So um, I can't really demo moving Ravencoin around either. Uh, I don't know, are there any special requests? I could sell some of this crypto.com uh, coin uh, and maybe buy a uh, David likes chain link. Uh, now we can buy chain link on uh, crypto.com if we want to. So, uh, and I've gone blurry again. <laughs> um, yeah, why don't we? Let's, let's buy a little bit of chain link. Let's see, where can I buy it? Let's see, I want to buy it. Uh, yeah, okay, so I'll buy some chain link on Binance and we'll throw it over onto my uh, ledger. 
So I've got my trusty Ledger Nano X here. And, uh, oh, um, there were some things I wanted to do with the Ledger. I have inspirations during the week with stuff that I want to show you guys. Um, all right, so let's launch Ledger Live. I'm sure this will all come back to me. There are some things that we do and I talk about that uh, you may, you, you kind of watch and may absorb, but I don't really explain all the time. All right, so, and one of those is the concept of the account. I get a lot of people, this is a very common question for me. I will get people that say, I just restored my ledger and uh, now I don't have, uh, and I, I still don't see my cryptocurrency, right? Um, now I'm assuming that they must have uh, lost Ledger Live too, because if you have Ledger Live, let's say for example, that you accidentally enter your pin incorrectly three times on your device and you need to uh, restore that device from your 24 word recovery phrase. Once you do that, you will have no apps on there, right? So the first order of business will be to get the apps back on there, but your accounts will still be there. Like I could crush this thing into dust and I could still log into Ledger Live and look at the balance of, of my accounts. I could actually even send crypto to these addresses without even using the device. If I wanted to send crypto out of these accounts, then I would need to restore the device and get it to work right. So if you have restored your device, the first order of business will be to reinstall the apps for all of the cryptocurrency that you're, you're managing, right? So you haven't lost your cryptocurrency, but you have, you've restored your ledger, but there are no, the private keys for all of your cryptocurrency wallets are held within this device when you restore that master private key. They can easily be regenerated simply by adding the apps back on there. So let's take the example of Ethereum. Let's, uh, well, first of all, and now we'll talk about accounts. Let's say, for example, that I don't want uh, anyone in my office or uh, my roommate or whatever to see that I have uh, this Bitcoin stored on uh, my device, all right? So I know that the wallet is on here, but I don't need to see the account, right? I can just go to the account, go to the wrench and hit delete and just delete the account, right? Now that account does not show up in my list. Uh, the, the value does not show up in my portfolio, but the uh, wallet can easily be regenerated simply by doing an add account. So I'll just go back over here, hit add account, choose Bitcoin, hit continue, and I need to enter the Bitcoin app on the device. Let's, uh, let's get this guy here. All right, so we need to be in the Bitcoin app, so we'll hit both buttons. Right, and now it says it's ready. And then you'll notice both check marks go by there. This is another thing that a lot of people have trouble with is that they'll be looking at something on the screen and they'll see that spinning thing and they'll say, hey, what's going on? Why, you know, what now? And I'll say to them, look at your device. Your device is waiting for you to take action. All right, so we'll hit continue here. Now what it's going to do is it's going to scan for that account, uh, any accounts that it finds on this device. Now me always uh, playing around with this, I've created several accounts on here. A lot of them are empty. Uh, so they're always any wallet that I've generated that has a transaction history is going to show up here, even if the balance is zero. But lo and behold, there's that Bitcoin wallet 
that I just deleted and I got it back again, right? It was never really gone. It, it simply just wasn't showing up in my list of accounts in Ledger Live. So, uh, so it can be hidden and revealed at will simply by deleting the account. And this in no way deletes the wallet. Now, what does delete the wallet is uh, taking the app off. All right, so uh, let's go ahead and uh, let's remove the Ethereum. All right, and I've not erased the wallet yet. The Ethereum wallet is still on this device. But if I go over here to Manager, and I need to go into, uh, whoops, We're going to quit the Bitcoin app and that'll take us out to the main screen. And now that we're entering the uh, manager, it's going to ask us to allow Ledger Manager. So I'll click both buttons there. All right. And then Ledger Manager should open at this point. All right. And now we're going to take uh, Ethereum off. So uh, if you'll notice here, I'm going to hit the trash can next to Ethereum and you'll watch here Ethereum will disappear. Ethereum is oh there it goes. So we hit that we see that processing and then the Ethereum app disappeared. It was next to Bitcoin. Now it's gone. Uh, in that case, what I, I literally deleted the private keys of all of the Ethereum wallets that I had on this device. I just deleted them right off the device. But does that mean that the wallets are gone? No, it does not. It means that all I need to do to regenerate those wallets, those private keys, is to add the app. The randomness occurs when the master private key of the device is created when you reset the device or reinitialize the device. The master key is randomly chosen, right? But from that master key, all of the other cryptocurrency wallets that are generated are done so in a deterministic fashion. They will always regenerate the exact same private key every single time. That's just the way the algorithm works. So I can safely delete the private key of my Ethereum wallet off this device completely, right? And now I can put it right back on there by installing the Ethereum app. Well, I'll let you guys see what's going on here. All right, so we'll hit install on Ethereum. All right, and then boobity boobity boob. Ethereum is back. Now we have two use cases here. I'm going to close this because uh, you'll notice and uh, the new version of live as, as soon as you add the app, it, it gives you the option of going ahead and adding the account right away too, which is nice. That helps. Uh, we have the use case. There was an Ethereum app already on here that is still usable, right? Now that the Ethereum app has been restored to the device, I can go right in and start using this guy again. So I could do a receive and you'll see that the uh, once I get in the Ethereum app, I can hit continue and then that address comes up and there it is right we can watch the addresses match so the point of that little exercise is to show you that uh, you could fully restore your device and you wouldn't have to do anything to your ledger live right if i did not delete any accounts out of my ledger live my Bitcoin, Litecoin, XRP, Bitcoin Cash, Vertcoin, all of the accounts that I have in Ledger Live. I could completely wipe and restore this device 
And then all I would need to do to uh, access the account uh, would be to just re-add the apps. I don't need to re-add the accounts because they're already there, right? They're already pointing to those wallets that would be restored when I restored the app, right? So if you've somehow wiped your device and you need to do a restore, you can just leave Ledger Live the way it is. Just restore the device with your uh, code, uh, your 24 word recovery code. But then also the, the second use case is that I did uh, delete one of the Ethereum apps. So I should go into add account. Right? I'm in the Ethereum app now, right? Come on, Rex. <laughs> I'm in the Ethereum app now, so I can hit add account. Uh, choose Ethereum, hit continue. I'm already in the Ethereum app. So uh, because I'm in the Ethereum app, it's going to scan for any Ethereum uh, private keys that I have stored on here. And when I added that Ethereum app on here, it regenerated any private keys that had a balance or a transaction history. So it's going to find them when I scan for them here. And then they'll be there. Someday. Another thing is patience, right? Sometimes these things take for, seems, seems like an eternity. There we go. All right, so not only did it find that Ethereum account, uh, it also found an, oh, there was one, it, it found the one that was already in there and it's dim. I don't need to add it, it's already in there. Uh, it found the one that I had removed from the accounts list uh, and it also offered me uh, a blank empty one. It always does that by default, right? If you go to add account. So, but all I want is that one that was in there already. But notice here, it's got that plus 12 because it also found uh, 12 B, uh, ERC20 token accounts associated with this Ethereum address. So I can hit account, close this off, and lo and behold, I've recovered my Ethereum account and a whole bunch of BAT tokens that I had stored on that Ethereum account. So I deleted the private key I reinstalled the app, the private key was regenerated, I went back to uh, Ledger Live and I re-added the account and everything's fine. So I get a lot of questions about, hey, uh, I talked to Ledger, uh, tech support, they explained to me how I to restore my device, but I still don't see my cryptocurrency. These are the steps, right? Restore the device, reinstall the apps, reinstall the accounts if you need to, but if the only thing that got restored is this, then uh, the accounts should already be there. Now, the opposite uh, problem that some people have is they've got uh, everything is fine on the device, but their computer crashes and they have to reinstall Ledger Live. Well, in that case, the apps should already be on there, right? Uh, with the Ledger X, you can hold like 20, 30 apps on here. So your apps would already be on there. You simply have to go back through and re-add your accounts in Ledger Live. Very simple to do. You just, uh, you know, as you're installing Ledger Live, you choose initialize device, and then you can get all your accounts back, all right? So uh, just thought I'd throw that out there. I get a lot of questions about that. All right, so uh, let's go over to Binance. And I'll use my BNB to buy some chain link. Let's see if I can. Oh, I can't withdraw chain link. Doggone it. What's up with Binance? Oh, because it's Binance uh, US. There's still a few things that are uh, being ironed out, right? Uh, that's kind of disappointing. Um, is US Tether? I want to see if Tether. Yeah, it looks like US Tether is an ERC20 token. So I did have someone ask me about storing US Tether. 
you can store US Tether in your own wallet, but it doesn't really make that much sense because the whole point of US Tether, it's a cryptocurrency that you can park on an exchange uh, that would uh, be uh, above the volatility, right? So let's say you're trading in and out of Bitcoin. And uh, you know you're uh, you're you're selling Bitcoin high and you're buying it low, right? So Bitcoin rises uh, by a thousand dollars one day, right? And so you wanna you wanna lock in that profit. So you sell that Bitcoin for U.S. Tether, uh, a one-to-one -one transaction. And the U.S. Tether is in your cryptocurrency account. And then let's just say that Bitcoin dips by a thousand. The next day, well, uh, that dollar value that you parked in the tether will allow you to rebuy that Bitcoin as it dips using that money that you parked in tether. If you hadn't done that, then you would have, when Bitcoin dropped, the Bitcoin that you held would drop in value, right? So the stable coin is a way of storing your, uh, you know, what you would call your fiat gains uh, so that they won't, uh, now you could, you know, you could get on the wrong end of the trade, right? You could uh, park it in Tether and then it goes up by, and then Bitcoin flies up by a thousand and you've got your money parked. So there's always a risk uh, with parking your money in Tether, right? Uh, but if you're a trader, then, uh, that's what you do. You park your value in Tether on the exchange. And that also means that when you see an opportunity to buy, it's right there parked in Tether and you can pull the trigger quick. So for me, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to store Tether on uh, a ledger. Um, I don't know. Maybe some people might want to do that uh, long term wise. Let's say, you know, they like they want to hold their gains in U.S. dollar. Uh, and they want to know, okay, I got $500 in value. Uh, I want to park it in Tether and I want it to be off the exchange, right? I want to put it in my own wallet so that I control the private key. That's fine too, but you wouldn't be able to uh, pull the trigger quickly on that. You would have to, if you saw the markets moving, you would have to move the Tether back to the exchange in order to make your trade. So I don't know. You might want to store Tether in your own wallet. You might not. But it looks to me like it's a, an ERC-20 token, right? And I don't think I have enough to really uh, move. It's, to, it's not too much to move. But I will, all right, because someone asked me a question about it. So I'll trade, uh, let's see, BTC, BNB. Okay, so I got a BNB market here. Right, and I want to buy. Oh, let's go back to. Was that? Did I click the tether? Tether, BNB tether. Okay, all right. Oh, so it says sell or buy BNB. I'm selling BNB for tether, right? So I'm going to take 25%. Mark it, uh, so it'll execute quickly, and you can't see because I'm blocking it. Okay, sorry about that, guys. Um, I can't seem to do that. Hmm. Can't move myself. Having trouble. Logitech Rio. Come on, Rex. Whoops. That's not what I want to do. Now what am I doing? I'll put myself at the top here. Oh, I can't seem to move myself. Well, I'll just turn myself off. There we go. Now you, now you can see. All right, so uh, sell BNB. Uh, I'm going to use market price. I'm going to sell 25% of the BNB that I have. It's not that much. Right, but it probably will be enough to give. Whoops! Oh no, it's not. <laughs> no, it's it's not enough. Oh, okay, 
So it worked. All right, so I got some tether. Uh, let's see how much tether I got. All right, so uh, I've got $11 worth of tether, right? Because that was $11 worth of uh, BNB coin. So now that we've got 11 tether, we should be able to transfer that over to our uh, ledger uh, live. So, uh, and I've never done this one before. Um, there is a way, hmm, they used to have an add token here. Oh, oh, okay, I know what I gotta do. All right, so I gotta get into the Ethereum account by clicking it and bringing it up here. And then uh, I've got all these tokens. Now I should be able to just send it directly to the Ethereum address and it will just appear even because it's not in the list yet. But let's hit add token and see if we can uh, do US Tether. Well, there it is right there. US Tether uh, ERC20. We'll hit continue. All right, and I'm in the Ethereum app already. Uh, it wants me to verify. Oh, okay. <laughs> let's do this. Uh, I'm gonna bring myself back. Here I am. And I'm going to turn this camera back on again. Application ready. Let's hit continue. All right, it's going to show us an address. And we just wanna verify that that's the same address showing on the screen. And then we'll approve that. All right, and now we can copy this address into our clipboard. And we can go over to Binance. And let's uh, withdraw this tether. All right, and we'll paste in that address there. And uh, let's do five. Let's just do five. Oh my gosh, it's gonna charge me a dollar just to do that. Mm. That's a bummer. All right, let's just do it all. <laughs> gonna charge me a dollar, so I'm only gonna get 10. But I'll do it for you guys. All right, so we'll hit submit there. And uh, then we're gonna need our uh, code. All right, so this is Binance US. Whoops. So there's the Binance US code. And it's going to want to confirm in an email. So we'll wait for that one to come in. There, I heard it come in. All right, we'll confirm that withdrawal. We'll go to withdrawal history. Uh, this is, we have to choose withdrawal and crypto. And so there you can see that 10 tether is processing. Let me turn this camera off for a moment. And then we can just wait for it to appear over here. Hmm. That's funny, it didn't appear in the list even though I did a receive on it. But it will appear uh, pretty soon. So we'll hit synchronize there. We might have to wait a little bit. Uh, let me see who's asking questions or and who's asleep <laughs> yeah sometimes I go blurry I don't know what it is I've got a pretty good webcam but uh, I don't know if it's getting old or uh, what happens but every now and then I blur out <laughs> it's not just you Juan. <laughs> sometimes I'm very clear sometimes I'm blurry <laughs> I can't thread the numbers at all. Yeah, there are a lot of hidden fees if you're not careful uh, on cryptocurrency exchanges. Uh, they offer you a lot of, uh, like for example, um, Binance US is giving you free trading fees for the month of November, until November 1st, pardon me for the month of October, basically. But you'll notice there that there was a transaction fee, a withdrawal fee. So uh, if you're uh, squirreling away money uh, and buying crypto, like say on a weekly basis, 
uh, it would behoove you maybe to wait uh, and do your withdrawals every month. That's what uh, Crypto Lark was talking about earlier uh, in his uh, tips and tricks. Uh, and it's good advice, right? Because there are a lot of little charges that might eat up all that money that you're so meticulously uh, socking away, right? Especially if you're accumulating Bitcoin uh, for a long-term hold and you're watching the price of Bitcoin go up and down on a day-to-day -day basis and uh, the Bitcoin that you've bought is less than what you paid for it and, and that stings. Uh, but you also know that you also got nickel and dimed when you did your withdrawals and your transfers, right? So always be cognizant of that sort of stuff, right? I think I may have made a mistake. <laughs> I hope not. I am almost certain. I mean, I was kind of surprised when someone told me that uh, Tether was an ERC-20 token. But I guess it makes sense that it is. <laughs> uh, okay, so Jack John Blackburn says, but what if you want to store dollars for a period of time, say more than a month before cashing out? And uh, so, yeah, the idea there is that uh, you're perfectly... Uh, free to just leave it on the exchange. Um, the exchanges uh, are pretty reliable. Um, but uh, if you're planning on uh, storing that tether for longer periods of time, then it might make sense for you to store it in your own wallet. I thought there were 13 tokens on here. <laughs> 12. Oh, there were 12. Right. So we're just waiting for the tether to show up as an ERC-20 token. And it will soon enough. Uh, we can always, like, uh, when you're waiting for cryptocurrency to transfer from an exchange, it always is a little bit nerve-wracking. You know, you can go over here to... Uh, the first thing that you noticed that I did was I went to withdrawal for crypto and I just confirmed that it actually did, uh, you know, was successfully withdrawn. You can see the status is processing and then you can see the address here that I sent it to. So I can confirm that here. All right, I can go back up here and I can see that uh, that Ethereum address is the same. Right, O six F, and then it ends in five five two five F. So uh, we know that we sent it to the right address. The only thing that we're not completely sure of is that uh, if uh, that's not an ERC twenty token, then uh, we just sent it down a rabbit hole. I still don't see it. So it's not going to show up in my Ethereum balance. It'll be a separate token. Okay. So there it is down there at the bottom. Uh, I guess it's an alphabetical order. So we got our $10 worth of uh, Tether, and it is safely stored in my Ledger Nano X. Now, uh, there are many things that could happen if I were to store it on Binance, even Binance US. Uh, I could lose access to the site um, because my internet's down, right? Uh, and it would be better for me if I knew that the, uh, if the power were out at my own house, I'd feel better knowing I owned the crypto. Uh, the power could go down uh, at their end, right? Their site could go down unexpectedly and I would lose access to that tether. Now, if I had the tether stored on my own device, 
uh, and Binance went down, I could uh, send the Tether over to Bittrex or Coinbase and use that to trade. I don't know that you can trade Tether on Coinbase or not. Uh, they have their own stable coin. But most of the other exchanges, uh, you can use Tether. So, yeah, I mean, there are a lot of good use cases for why you might want to store a decent amount of Tether on your own, uh, in your own wallet, uh, where you control the private keys. Right? Uh, it's not that big of a deal to transfer it back to, the, to an exchange. Uh, I mean, that's part of why I do these demos so you guys can feel comfortable moving cryptocurrency back and forth. I mean, that's one of the beauties of cryptocurrency is that it is a digital coin that can be moved back and forth uh, with quite, quite, e quite, bleh, quite easily. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, and I could have actually done the, the Ethereum, uh, Juan mentioned I could have checked the Ether Explorer. We could have seen the transaction on the Ethereum blockchain and see how many confirmations there were and get a lot of information about that transaction. Uh, I just kind of waited until I saw it here, right? And then we can see that we just received it uh, from Binance. Right. Now, I think someone mentioned Crypt, K-R-P-T. So if you're looking to buy a particular coin, I can't tell you whether it's a, a good coin or not, because I don't really know that much about it. Oh, Cryptarium. Uh, well, I'm pretty sure you can buy it on their app, right? So um, if you... Um, and I use their uh, app. They they approached me, and I when I first installed the Cryptarium app, I there were some uh, parts of the wallet that weren't very functional, uh, and I wasn't impressed. But they've had several upgrades over time, and uh, you know the Cryptarium app. You basically, uh, you can, um, hmm. <laughs> down here. Okay, so you can connect it to your bank account and you can uh, fund the account from your bank account. Uh, you can download the Cryptarium app on your uh, smartphone. And then uh, you can go to the exchange and uh, you know you can buy uh, crypt if if you own it, uh, but let's say uh, yeah you would have to buy some cryptocurrency using your bank account, and then uh, from there, hmm, huh? I don't know why you wouldn't be able to buy it here. Let's say uh, maybe it's it's only a Bitcoin trade. Yeah. Uh, you'd have to uh, buy some Bitcoin on Cryptarium app. Cryptarium app uh, does a lot of things, but it's also uh, an exchange, right? So you can just buy it right there on the exchange. Uh, in their app, you can buy it. Uh, all you need to do is fund uh, from your bank account, right? So there's lots of ways to fund this account. And then uh, you could also transfer uh, cryptocurrency in there that you already had. Right. So uh, let's say that I had some Bitcoin in there and uh, let's see, is this top up. OK. Yeah, it looks like uh, I could just send Bitcoin to this address and then I could use that Bitcoin to buy some Cryptarium. Right. And then also, uh, if you look up Cryptarium, on uh, coin market cap uh, just go over here to the markets tab and it'll tell you the different markets where you can buy cryptarium you can buy it on kucoin hit btc idex coin exchange binance dex so uh, there but there's not a lot of exchanges out there selling it you see it's not on binance us it's not on coinbase it's not on bitrex it's not on poloniex so I would recommend if you want to buy some crypt, uh, go download the app 
and get it all set up, set up your wallet and everything, fund it from your bank account or deposit some cryptocurrency in there and use, you know, Bitcoin preferably seems like uh, the Bitcoin trading pair is easy way to buy crypt. And then you can uh, purchase it right on your phone. And uh, I believe when you set this up, <clears throat> I don't know that this is a non-custodial wallet. I don't believe you control the private key on this. So it might behoove you to store that crypt uh, in your own wallet. I don't know that you can store a uh, crypt cryptarium. <laughs> uh, in uh, a ledger, right? So uh, you might have to uh, figure out where uh, Cryptarium. Yeah, there it is. Okay, so they, they do make wallets. Um, see, I don't remember if this was a, if they gave me a backup code on this wallet. So, but it looks like that's the easiest way to hold it is in their app. Hmm, interesting that they don't have a desktop wallet. But uh, one nice thing about Cryptarium is you can reserve some gram using their app uh, if you're willing to pre-buy it. So if you're into that, you might want to check out the Cryptarium app. You can just download it on the App Store. So I hope that was helpful for uh, Dolland. Question for everyone. What is the most interesting coin token in your portfolio right now? Uh, I will answer that question myself. Uh, I tend to, I, I, I go with my emotions a lot, but I also tend to think uh, that sounds like a good idea. Uh, so I'm kind of quick to pull the trigger. And then, but I also take into a lot of uh, things into account. Uh, I like Bitcoin, but that's kind of uh, a mainstay for everyone. Um, and for a while there, I was on uh, BNB, uh, the Binance coin. I still feel like Binance coin is a great coin to have and hold. But uh, lately, I've noticed Ravencoin. Uh, they just got it just got added to Binance US. I just did a video on Ravencoin. Um, Ravencoin mining. Um, is attractive because it's ASCII resistant. So uh, you might want to check out Ravencoin uh, if you're interested in uh, mining with your GPU, or if you're just interesting interested in grabbing a coin that's new um, and exciting. Right? It does a lot of cool stuff. Um, you know, there's several wallets that already support it. Uh, you can download one of their wallets. You can store it in Exodus, Trust Wallet, Kobo, Atomic Wallet, uh, Crypto.com. Uh, so uh, you can create a paper wallet. That's pretty cool. right? And you can get uh, Ravencoin on a lot of exchanges right now. Uh, Bittrex, Binance. Uh, not Coinbase, I guess. Of course not. Not yet. But a lot of uh, cryptocurrency exchanges support Ravencoin right now. So uh, kind of an in, in fairly new, too. It's been around, uh, just came out. Uh, let's see. Raven. I think it was uh, this year. Oh, no, May of 18. I was wrong. It's been around for a year or two now. Not quite. A little over a year, right? May, March 10 of 18. <laughs> I misspoke on my video earlier. When I posted my video, I said it was uh, May of this year. I was wrong. Mr. David likes chain link. That's cool. Yeah, just like I said, BTC is, you know, that's the interest. BTC is really interesting. There are so many layers of it. Uh, the Bitcoin onion, right? Uh, you've got, uh, you know, the investment thing, right? You can think of it like a stock. You can think of it like money. You can spend it. People can pay you in Bitcoin. You can pay them in Bitcoin. 
And then there's the whole underlying technology of Bitcoin that, that I'm starting to explore more, which uh, kind of gives you more insight into what it's about. There's the whole philosophy of Bitcoin, which is the unbanked uh, society, uh, the decentralized uh, currency that doesn't rely on any banks or governments. So there's a lot of uh, facets to Bitcoin that I find fascinating. But, you know, a lot of those uh, apply to many of the altcoins as well. So, um, you know, if you want to expand your horizons, dig into one of the cryptocurrencies that you're interested in. Uh, there's the Mastering Bitcoin book, there's Mastering Ethereum, which talks a lot about, you know, it talks about Ethereum and what it's all about. Um, there's uh, Monero, Mastering Monero. Uh, if you're interested in uh, the privacy coins, there's a lot of, uh, you know, all you need is a, a computer, an internet connection, and a little bit of curiosity, and you can really delve into the technology that underlies uh, all of these uh, coins in cryptocurrency. Uh, it's not just for trading, right? There's a lot, a lot of interesting uh, mind exercises that you can uh, delve into uh, in this sector. Uh, because invariably, when the prices start to rise again, and they will, you're going to have a lot of people asking you about cryptocurrency. Because you might bring it up. You might say, well, I have a little Bitcoin. And they'll say, oh my God, what is that? How do you hold it? Where do you get it? Because I keep hearing, you know, that it's, you know, at an all time high. How do I get a hold of it? And they'll probably ask you what it is. So uh, it's good to be equipped mentally to be able to answer those kind of questions. So if you have it and you hold it and uh, people ask you why, uh, they probably going to ask you what it is and how does it work. So you might want to have those facts ready as well. Oh, that's right. Scott likes Digibyte, which is cool. Uh, do I prefer Coinbase or Binance? I'm kind of in the Binance camp lately um, just because uh, the trading fees are low right now. I'll, it remains to be seen how much they'll charge me. But if I, put, if I use my uh, bank account to buy Bitcoin on Coinbase, I have to wait a few days before it clears. And if I use my debit card, it's instantaneous, but uh, they charge me a pretty high fee. So for the moment, I'm in the Binance camp. Uh, Bittrex is a good as well, uh, but I, I, I really like Binance. It seems like a very uh, powerful force in the cryptocurrency community right the, the largest exchange and they seem to be doing a lot of innovation as well so uh, I'm kind of in Binance camp right now <laughs> all right guys so uh, it's a little late I'm gonna sign off thanks for joining I know uh, what I talked about was a little dry tonight but uh, I feel like uh, there a lot of these things I like to share with you guys uh, got a little bit of a captive audience. You guys uh, like to tune in. So I thought maybe I'd cover some of the underlying subject matter uh, from under underneath. So anyway, uh, glad you came. Uh, sorry we didn't get to move a whole lot of crypto tonight, but uh, we did a little bit. And uh, I hope that if there were any nagging questions in the back of your mind that uh, some of them got answered tonight. Don't forget the live stream is every Friday, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Please join me again for the live Q&A live from Michigan where you can throw out your questions and I'll do my best to get them answered. If you like this video, give me a thumbs up. If you'd like to subscribe to my channel, I would appreciate it. When you subscribe, there's a little bell that you can click that will allow you to be alerted whenever I post new content. Once again, thanks for joining me and hope to see you again soon.